I'd like to introduce our three speakers, Kylie Jarrett, Funda Ustek, and Nelly Kampuri. I'll give you a brief biographical introduction on them. Kylie Jarrett is an associate professor at the Media Studies Department of Maynooth University in Ireland. She's the author of Feminine Laser and Digital Media, The Digital Housewife. In addition to a number of studies on digital platform economy, she's working on digital labor. It's the most recent work, studying digital work and platform work in today's economy. I'll go ahead and introduce the other two as well. Fundo Stick is a researcher, researcher and project manager in fair work at the University of Oxford. She's a sociologist and interested in studying matters of justice and ethics in emerging technologies from a gender perspective and immigration. Nelly Kampuri is a political scientist and researcher in gender matters, working now as a senior researcher at the National Hellenic Research Foundation of Athens in Greece, and she works at the Hellenic Open University teaching. She studies gender, work, immigration, science, and technology. Nelly, Kylie, and Funda are here as part of the COST activity uh, program. It's a privilege to have them. We don't always have the opportunity to hear from all three of them in Barcelona. So if you're ready with your translation equipment, we'll give the floor to Kylie. I will be very strict. <laughs> very strict. Um, uh, I hope this is on, lovely. Um, yeah, thank you. It's been actually quite inspiring to be here um, listening to um, uh, research and amazing feminist voices. It's been it's been great, um, quite quite bracing for me. Um, so I was asked to talk about internet intersectional feminist perspectives on platform work or approaches to platform work. Um, but that starts with the term uh, intersectional, intersectional feminism, which is a contested term uh, these days. It's been uh, hollowed out by its institutionalization um, and its mobilization then in ways that, that end up just merely supporting the status quo um, uh, and, in, and ultimately create impediments to achieving justice, <laughs> despite that not being the intention. Um, it's also very hard to articulate a feminism that doesn't proclaim itself as intersectional, even when it's not, like it's just not thinkable these days. Um, and it also needs to be examined in light of the critiques emerging from critical race theorists, um, such as uh, Surma Bilge, about the specificity of the concept and its uh, relationship to African-American experience and its roots in chattel slavery, which is quite specific. And I'm also keenly aware of my position here as a white cis het heterosexual woman from the global north uh, talking up here about intersectional feminism. Um, but I think that situatedness is really important to what intersectional feminism is about. Um, so, uh, so for me, intersectional feminism is a, really about sensitizing us to um, the entanglements of oppressions um, that happen, if we're talking about platform work, within the context of work platform work. And this applies to how work is experienced, but also how work and good work in particular um, are defined. Um, and we've already talked a bit today about the sexual division of labor, which is fundamental to, to uh, the definition of work. And I specifically talk about this as entanglements rather than intersections, which is an idea uh, that Titi Bhattacharya talks about, um, which is uh, partly to think about this as both a breadth and depth model. So it's not single vectors of oppression meeting at a particular instance. Um, it brings our attention to how these kind of differently valued social categories um, uh, that manifest on a particular plane, on a particular moment or experience of work. Um, but they also then hand off to um, of those valuations and categories to other aspects of the work. They are fundamentally entangled from that point, And they sometimes have the same origins or their origins are so fundamentally um, uh, 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 connected, like capitalism and patriarchy, that it's very hard to assume they're coming from different 
uh, angles. Um, so it is about that kind of depth and breadth model, um, which, uh, uh, you know, hands off uh, oppressions and injustices across the spectrum of life, um, even though it, like it's happening in work. And so this framing um, uh, brings us to two key considerations. Um, and as we've been discussing in the meeting of uh, the intersectional feminism thematic working group in the P Will project, the approach highlights the need to really look at the specificity of workers' experience. Um, we mustn't assume a universal experience of labor, of work, of access to work, of labor management. Um, and even the experience of the regimes of exploitation and alienation are differently distributed. And so we have to absolutely pull out, uh, pull out that specificity um, because they're all complicated by age, race, gender, migration status, ability status, um, and geography as well with a nod to, to Che's work on geographic specificity. Um, and I think we need to be, uh, um, uh, as researchers, need to be kind of uh, capturing this specificity in what we do when we try to understand platform work, but in our policy making uh, and in our platform design and also in our labour struggles, it needs to reflect this complexity. The second consideration um, comes from the feminist principle that the personal is political um, and the insights of social reproduction theory, which says we need to look beyond the factory gates for the impact of work and the shaping of work. Um, so the entangled politics um, that generate exclusions uh, do not begin and end at those gates. Um, and we need to track how workers are shaped as social actors, uh, even before they enter the workplace or think about the workplace environment. But then how the shaping of the worker within the workplace then uh, feeds back into society. And I think that was part of the care work discussion you were having. Um, and so this kind of intersectional feminist approach is kind of both expansive and yet specific at the same time. So it really complicates what it is we're doing um, uh, and what it is we're looking for. But I've got, if I've got time, I've just got one last thing. From being in this, um, this discussion today, um, I think an intersectional fe feminist approach should also be really bloody angry. It needs to be annoyed. It needs to be critical and it needs to be doing that with a view to being transformative, using that power and that agency to transform the context. At the same time, it needs to be careful and not in the sense of avoiding risk, but in the sense of being full of care. We need to be caring for um, others uh, in our intersectional feminist approaches, in our, um, in our intersectional feminist politics, and by building solidarities and alliances. Um, but we also need to be careful with ourselves because uh, it is hard work, it is demoralizing work, and it is constant work, and it is exhausting work. Um, but we also need to be, as was also pointed out earlier today, careful with the planet. Um, as we do this. So um, that's my idea of what, what an intersectional feminist approach to platform work might look like. So that's me. Thank you. Um, thank you. Muchas gracias. Ahora Fundaus. Thank you. Now Fundaus Text Builder, please. Thank you. Um, thank you. My talk will um, actually um, be s touching on a similar themes. Um, but, and I will start with rather than sort of, you know, what we should be doing, um, I will talk about the two misconceptions about women platform workers. The first one is that uh, platform work offers women greater opportunities for financial independence and can break uh, boundaries between unpaid and paid labor or invisible versus visible work. And the second misconception is that platform work offers women workers more flexibility. I'll, I'll start with three examples. The first one comes from um, an Indian food delivery platform called Swiggy, um, which locks women out at 6 p.m for safety reasons. But this means that women workers miss out on dinner orders uh, and nighttime orders, and they can't actually work uh, according to their own schedules. 
Um, the second is Uber. Um, they do it in many countries, but this specific example comes from Mexico. Um, Uber offers women women-only rides by matching women drivers with women workers for safety reasons again. But this means that they miss out significantly on potential rides as there are a limited number of women riders and there are even more limited number of women riders who specifically request women drivers. Again, safety precautions might limit women's chances of making ends meet on the platforms. The third one is a French care work platform called UP or UPs, however you want to pronounce them. And they, um, they operate in a variety of countries in Europe, such as the UK, Belgium and France. And they offer uh, workers a matching service. Um, but on the platform, it tells the workers that if they list their rate at more than eight pounds an hour, which is way below the minimum wage in the UK, um, they're unlikely to find a job on the platform, implying that this is the rate most customers are willing to pay and what other workers are charging. By doing that, essentially, uh, the platform brokers how much care should cost and how workers' time should be valued or not. In these three examples, you see differences in how platforms mediate pay, working hours, relations with customers, and how the overall concern of women's safety, of course, a legitimate concern, end up introducing other limitations, such as financial independence and decision making. They also show that platforms do get involved in mediating how women's work can be structured, organized, and valued, and what essentially is safe for them or not. I'm aware that these are anecdotal experiences of women workers and they may not be shared across the board. I'm also aware that skill levels, as in the kind of value that will be attributed to the work if it was performed off the platform, plays an important role here. The value attached to domestic work found and performed off the platforms is not the same as interior design work found on or off the platforms. Women's experiences also differ by country, um, by sector, by the overall regulation of specific services they perform, as in domestic work and care work remain largely unregulated uh, in many countries in the world. These differences are really important to pay attention to, as there's no single way to explain or account for what is platform work for women workers and whether it is a better or a worse alternative to other forms of work. Before I move on to explaining what we do at Fair Work, uh, there's one more misconception I would like to draw attention, attention to. That platform work is easier for women because they can fit it around their care responsibilities. This might indeed be the case for some women, um, but for the majority of workers we interviewed at Fair Work, it's not the case. Platform work requires a lot of investment from workers, especially in care work, beauty work, or online work, where workers need to create a profile and maintain this profile. They need, constantly, they need to be constantly active on, the, on multiple platforms, respond to messages, send messages to potential clients, even when they know they may never actually receive a response, or they may, send hour, they may spend hours in a conversation online, but might not actually get a job in the end. This is unpaid labor, it's wage theft. The hourly calculations of work or the piece rate for services do not feature this time investment. But it means that women invest a lot of time in platforms and if in the end, at the end of this time investment they find a job, they have to, to fit to the schedule of the job rather than the job fitting their schedule. With shift-based work or delivery work or in-ride hailing, the flexibility is further an issue as there are certain times orders or service requests happen in the day and platforms want the workers to be active in those hours, not when the women's babies are taking their afternoon naps or their children are at school. So at Fair Work, uh, we are an international network of researchers um, studying working conditions and platform economy across the world. It's an action research uh, project. So we don't only study the platform economy, but we try to change it. Um, we have Fair Work Brazil, um, Serbia, and UK me uh, represented here today. Um, but Fair Work is currently working in 38 countries, and we have over 250 researchers. Um, we ha what we do is that we study the working conditions on the platforms, and then we put uh, these rating. Um, we put these. Um, um, we put our study into a sort of a league table where we rate the platforms uh, based on the five principles of fair, fair work which we developed and um, then display the uh, platforms on, um, on a league table. 
So far, we have rated more than 300 uh, platforms across the world, and um, as part of our study, have um, have encouraged 100 changes from platforms um, on conditions around pay, um, on uh, on uh, topics like pay, conditions, contracts, management, and representation. If you want to hear more about uh, what we do, you can go to our website, <laughs> fair.work. Thank, Thank you. Hello. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a wonderful space, a wonderful opportunity to share ideas and experiences. Um, while I was thinking what to say today, um, I found myself in a weird situation because um, I, ha I'm, I'm, I had to comment on a subject that I'm still struggling with. And the reason why, the main reason why I'm struggling with this subject is because most of the, what is being written about platform work is, does not have an intersectional feminist perspective. It is mainly about male platform workers and this, this is, makes it difficult and also necessary to uh, discuss what we are being, we are discussing today. So I would like to ask some questions that, uh, without precisely know the answer. And I hope we can discuss and exchange ideas about this question. Well, the first question I think we need to address is if the platform worker is male. And I think this is an important question because in most uh, statistical studies we see that male platform workers appear to be the majority of platform workers, but at the same time, it all depends on categorizations. We, we tend to exclude a lot of platforms uh, like Airbnb or Etsy or platforms that are not really considered to be doing, to be, to involve actual work, which are you, where women are the majority, and it, it's obviously problematic that we are reproducing these kinds of uh, gender divisions, uh, understandings of uh, labor um, that uh, we, we have been criticizing as feminists for many, many uh, years, decades. And this brings me to the second question, which is, uh, what do we mean by male and female worker? And I, I think my feeling here is that w when we talk about male workers, we tend to uh, reproduce ideas that have to do with uh, the Fordist paradigm. And what we tend to criticize about the platform worker is the fact that he does not, cannot conform to the Fordist paradigm. But if we look back at, at feminist and uh, post-colonial genealogies, who was actually the Fordist platform worker? It was mainly white, male, middle-class men in the global north. So uh, what are we really talking about when we are talking about labor rights, when our um, model and what we tend to use as the universal understanding of the platform worker depends on this kind of um, conception of labor that is still reproduced in Fordist um, concepts. And this brings me to the third question, which I would like to discuss, which has to do with um, how we reproduce these historically specific uh, notions of labor um, in relation to gender, race, class, and sexuality. And would would, if we introduce an intersectional perspective, would this change our perspective in research, but also in the, the ways in which we demand things? Um, and I think here um, it is important, as the other um, speakers uh, explained before, to introduce a reproductive labor as a consideration from the beginning of research and from the way in which we articulate demands about the platform economy. And here, this involves also considering that a lot of platform work takes place in private spaces, which makes it rather difficult, not only to study, it, but also to self-organize, also to participate in struggles that are visible, and also to, um, make demands uh, comprehensive in a, a framework that is male dominated. Uh, another aspect that I think is important is to understand that a lot of the people who do this type of work are migrants and that a lot of these people are migrant women. 
and also to reconsider the division between paid and unpaid work. Um, I mean, we, we know that a lot of what is happening online is about unpaid work. Uh, I, I will not go into the details, but for example, if you look at Airbnb again, which is an, a, a platform that I'm studying right now, uh, hosts are, are, are asked to recreate authentic experiences, and this involves a lot of work, but at the same time, and a lot of cultural appropriation and all other stuff, but at the same time, you know, this is a type of work that is not being recognized. That's why Airbnb is not considered a platform worth uh, studying from a labor perspective. Um, the fifth point I would like to, to raise is how crucial I think it is to explore how platform workers negotiate work with care. And here, I believe that it is important to, to consider not only um, how women negotiate work with care, but also how men with care responsibility negotiate work with care. Because being in a platform environment, it often uh, 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 raises questions about flexibility, how we work with flexibility, how we care about our children, the elderly. Also for men, because precisely because they have the same working conditions as women had in feminized and racialized sectors. So, this brings me to the final question, which is to address the platform labor in its diversity. And for me, this involves also to consider not only femininities, but also masculinities and LGBTQ uh, subjectivities and consider these as an integral aspect of how we understand the platform economy. And for me, this is an important issue. Uh, because a lot of what, is, what we know about flat platforms is based on male-dominated platforms. And even when we look at these platforms, we have to problematize masculinities mm -hmm. and how uh, perhaps they are being fractured, how they, they are being injured, how they are being um, developed within these platforms. Can I, can I say a final thing? Yes, okay, sorry. I know I have more time. And the final thing I want to say is that, of course, male um, platform uh, laborers have, have done, have participated in very important struggles. But I think if we miss this point about intersectional, uh, intersectional perspectives, we also miss uh, struggles that are less um, visible and less uh, spectacular and less in the public eye. And they might be happening right now and we have no idea that they are happening because we are not looking towards this direction. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Eh, tenemos tiempo para preguntas. We do have time for some questions. We have about 15 minutes because our speakers have been really conscientious about uh, staying on time. So let's take some questions. Well, I have a question. In fact, I really liked all of our speakers' presentations, especially Funda, as she referred to platform work and women's perspectives. There are some issues that I think are very important. For example, the effect that it has on us, this system of points or penalization of the algorithm, and how this can be a token of exchange for cases of harassment. The customer knows who's coming. Is it that girl or someone else? Sometimes they have our information beforehand. And just uh, wanted to mention that because I think it's important to bear it in mind. And for platform work, uh, Cruzcaya from, from Ecuador has said that what is the consequence for our bodies of this work uh, through algorithmic logics? Common diseases like cystitis in women who spend hours and hours on the street and don't have a work proper workplace per se, and that these platforms work the same way everywhere, regardless of the regulations, but 
the more cracks there are in public policies, the stronger these platforms are. I don't like the word flexibility or freedom because that's like the standard for these platforms. But for women, it could be the case that this is uh, one of the opportunities that these people have to be able to get more income through situations of self-exploitation. These platforms offer you in exchange for more exploitation, I offer you more income. And this could also happen with family reconciliation policies. In exchange for labor rights, I, I allow you to take better care of your children in exchange for sacrificing your labor rights. So the more cracks in the system, the stronger these platforms are and the more impact on us. Questions and then respond, or do you prefer to have? Okay. In that case, we will pick up a couple more questions and then our speakers can respond freely. Berlin panel. Uh, yeah, no need to translate for me. <laughs> you can take it off. Um, yeah, so one thing, particularly for you, Kylie, I was, but I, I, you know, for the whole panel, I think this would be um, a helpful question, maybe. Um, one thing that I found really interesting that you were saying is about anger and how intersectional feminist approaches to platform work need to be angry and need to be annoying. And I found that very impactful because women's anger is something that is often pathologized or something that needs to be mitigated. Women are not encouraged to be angry. And I agree with you, but at the same time, having dealt with platforms myself, they don't really respond to anger. So how can we channel that anger while still being angry in the studies that we're doing, if that makes sense. And yeah, like obviously I'm asking to you, I'm asking you because you mentioned that, but I would love to hear a wider perspective from the whole panel. Because you know, even in terms of intersectionality, obviously some women can be angrier than others. Uh, I'm thinking of, you know, unhelpful stereotypes from crazy Italian women, angry black women, stuff like that. How can we have that conversation while still channeling our anger? Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. And we have a question. So we have a question from Mayu, and then I come to you, Claire. Unfortunately, we're not able to hear this question very well. Let's see if we can clarify the microphone sound. Yes, the framework that you use to classify platforms which has a number of items in it. My question is, how do you integrate these items into the gender equality analysis? I was doing some research on platform economy and masculine violence. The only place where I found an item related with that had to do with safety or security. When you talk about domestic violence, if you're working or riders, when they make their deliveries, the violence that they receive is a matter of safety. But do you include this as safety, security in general, or something specific with a strong gender component, if it is gender-based violence? And also other gender equality uh, items, how are those integrated into those items? I could not find it myself. How do you work that into your analysis? The research is excellent, but it was hard for me to identify those specific aspects. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentations. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question which I've asked myself, and so I'm taking advantage of having all of you there. Uh, I, would like, I would like to ask you what, uh, how you would translate this perspective in terms of rights and maybe obligations. So as you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer, and so from the legal perspective, I've been trying to identify these, uh, these rights, and, and I would love to have your opinion on that. Thank you very much. 
Yeah. Eh, vamos a hacer una ronda de respuestas y si luego hay alguna pregunta. We'll have a round of answers and if we have any other questions, we'll be able to take those then. Um, thank you for the questions and, and the comments. Um, the first comment uh, was great, excellent um, um, intervention. And um, we, of course, um, work with workers, listen to them as much as possible throughout our work. That's part of what we do. Um, and um, um, the kind of things that you, you told us now are very important and uh, we hear it time and time again in terms of self-exploitation, the platforms creating algorithmic management systems or incentive systems which drive workers, not necessarily only women workers, but workers in general to work more to achieve uh, the incentives and then just push that incentive level to a higher rate and then they need to work even more to get that that kind of sort of constant um, um, constant gamification of work and uh, the resulting self-exploitation from that and this is part of uh, both the fair conditions and fair management um, criteria that we use because um, it involves the algorithmic management and the kind of practices involved in not only rating but also blocking workers if they can't manage and meet certain targets, certain levels. Um, so this is definitely related to, related to a platform providing fair conditions and, and fair management of, of the work, work process. Um, in terms of the second question about the way we use to categorize platforms, um, fair work is, um, is sort of um, our, our main goal is to establish minimum standards of work for the platform economy. It does not have a specific gender focus, but gender is there. As I mentioned, uh, we are more than 250 researchers now. All of us come from different fields. Um, some, are, uh, some of us are gender scholars, some aren't. But the way we, see, we interpret our sort of, you know, um, data when we collect the data, how in integrates those approaches and this is why um, I could focus on gender in my work because this is what I do um, but in, it, in, its, in itself it is not a sort of a um, gender criteria as it stands um, but in it of course safety and security of women platform workers play an important role because um, this is how we develop, but also update our principles based on the conversations we have with the workers, based on the things that they tell us, this features in our work and the way we rework our principles. And that's an ongoing process. Um, in terms of the, um, the final question about um, how do we translate these into rights, um, I think this is the next step. This is what we're all, um, at least at Fair Work, I should talk about myself, but um, this is what we're working, uh, working towards. Um, obviously, at least in the context of Fair Work, if uh, workers were given employment contracts, some of these principles would be automatically met, like the, uh, the fair, um, fair pay principle, the first one is minimum wage. And then it would be an automatic right or um, some kind of social protection or sick leave or parental leave. Some of these would be, would be then met. Um, but this is a long road. <laughs> this is a long discussion. Yeah, I might, um, if I can, pick up um, just on that question uh, um, as well, just while flowing on from that about, before I get to the question of anger. Um, yeah, I was going to say it is about learning from workers what the rights and uh, et cetera that they need. But I think there is a challenge for rights which tend to be so universalist right, in their framing. It's the nature of them. Um, and I think that there is a translation issue with the specificity, but I'm sure, I'm, I'm no expert on doing that. That's, that's slightly beyond my remit uh, of how you go about doing that. But um, I think we have a good basis <laughs> from Fair Work. Um, um, but yeah, it does, it does create, like an inter intersectional approach does create uh, um, tensions 
within it that need to be resolved. Um, and so more power to you in resolving that. <laughs> um, um, Nelly, did you want to kick in about that question while we're on the theme of the rights? No? Um, <laughs> yeah. No, go ahead, and, and then we'll come back to the okay. question. Okay. Um, but for me, this question is um, interesting, but difficult to answer. And uh, I, I think that the whole point about um, um, about social rights is it's not only about the legal aspects. For me, the most important uh, thing is how you create structures, care structures that can support uh, people's uh, so, um, social relations instead of uh, extracting from social relations. So, as today we are living in a period of uh, of a care crisis. For me, the important thing is not just to grant rights to some people based on uh, some entitlements, especially if these entitlements are, are tied to the nation state and uh, the migration regime that exists. But the important thing is to create structures that are care structures good enough to, to, to meet those needs, those, those care needs. So, it is a, if, if we do not have um, these structures, there's no point for me in talk, to talk about rights. And um, this is crucial because when we are talking about platform work, we are not talking only about the global north. Okay, it, it, we are not talking about only about welfare states in Europe that are not working very well, but still, you know, um, have some um, they, they still work in, to a certain extent. We're, we are talking about um, care structures that have collapsed in many parts of the world and also in many parts of Europe. So I think that the important question to ask is not, before we ask who is entitled to, uh, to care, is to ask what care structures we have, what kinds of care structures we have. Lovely. And now on to Carolina's difficult question about anger. Uh, um, I, um, I, I, I debated whether or not to use anger as the word. I think if I thought about it longer, I may not have used it. But I think there are multiple forms of anger. There's a very hot anger that doesn't necessarily, that, that becomes parasitic and, and eats away at you. But then there's a cold fury <laughs> that can motivate i think it allows you to it does still burn you out but all of this struggle burns you out um uh and i and i, and I think it's it, i think it is about that translation into into a kind of I, th I think we need safe places and spaces to vent the uh, passionate anger um and then mobilizing the energy that comes from that, that drive, that commitment that comes from that is what you then mobilize out in the streets and in your act interactions with the platforms, for instance, who do not care. Um, I think that's how we might use anger. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know. Maybe it was the wrong word, but it's definitely passionate. <laughs> We have now seven minutes, so if anybody really wants to ask something, this is the time. If not, I'm sure that over lunch you'll have all the time in the world to have a chat. Yeah, apologies. Me again. Hi. Yeah, going back to what uh, Maya was saying, I understand that in fair work there are lots of researchers, I don't know how many men, women, I don't know what the ratio is of male researchers to female researchers, but I do think that sometimes at fair work, you talk about, you know, fair payment or, or whatever, and it is said, and without being too Eurocentric, because not everywhere do you find legislation that might cover you or worker statutes. Um, 
I, I do think it, it's important not to talk about, you know, well, apart from the labor relationship and then talk about fair work when you know we do have a reivindication of a contractual relationship because that would give us rights and for me from writers for rights and many other uh, sisters movements that's what we are standing up for and there is a criteria that we could apply and then we can see whether there is a gender perspective is precisely the gender element, particularly in the digital world and with everything we're saying. So from me, and perhaps because I have worked and I am working as a writer, or perhaps just out of ignorance, I do believe it is important not to leave aside certain elements of uh, you know contractual relationship. And I think it is crucial to add gender elements. I think that's important. Thank you. Any last minute? Make a wee comment, um, if I could. Oh, yeah. yeah, just <laughs> someone is talking. Someone speaking. <laughs> it's me. Um, I just wanted to come to a point Nelly uh, talked about around uh, uh, gender and the platforms, and uh, there's been very little discussion of online creator platforms and platform work in that environment thus far. Um, uh, and I think that's just one of those feminized forms of labor, the cultural workers on the platforms that um, isn't getting enough attention in certain spaces. Get enough attention from the people who are doing it, but um, uh, uh, it's, it's, again, a form of platform work that also needs as much critical attention. Hi, yeah, this is a question for Funda. Um, and I was thinking about what we, the case that we heard about the red button that has been developed by Co-op Cycle. Um, I understand that it was mostly by female riders that have, um, that have uh, instigated this. And I was curious to know uh, when you've spoken to female gig workers about the different initiatives that you've mentioned, for example, Uber's only female uh, um, clients, what, what, what are their opinions? Um, do they see this? I mean, because you presented it as it wasn't a great move. Uh, so I just wonder what the, the interviewees are saying. Uh, thank you. So I had a question for Fanda. Uh, you started out your presentation with some misconceptions, but I would also like to phrase another misconception, which is uh, engaging in platform work doesn't always mean that uh, women don't get more opportunities as well. So I do think that's an empirical question that we should ask and not like a point of departure. Um, and another thing uh, that I want to ask, I don't know, about rights uh, and sort of a reflection on it, so if we think about care work and underappreciated areas of work, care work is one of them. Um, and we think about uh, global care change, right? And I have to think about the figure of the au pair, who is a young girl from 18 years old, who flies from often from, you know, the global south to uh, whichever Western uh, nation here to work maybe for 80 pounds uh, per week. And we all find it acceptable. It's even legalized in law, right? we all find it acceptable because we have global care crises. Um, and in all the countries that I know in Western Europe, it's a practice that we all find legitimized. So if we would rethink this and we would value actually what our pairs do, um, then we would maybe bring the discussion forward about thinking about rights connected to care work. So. In ultimas palabras, last Last words from the speakers, and we're closing. But, um, I don't know if I, if I understood correctly in the beginning, but um, I I didn't mean that fair work um, specific. Uh, fair work says that um, you need to have a contractual sort of a, like an employment relationship to be able to meet these standards. Actually. In um, opposite to that, we argue that regardless of the contractual status, the workers should have the minimums which we specify in the fair work principles. 
Um, and in terms of adding a gender element, I, I think the gender element is there. We talk to all the workers and we try to capture as many sectors and as, as diverse um, worker experiences as possible. And when I mean by um, what I mean by gender is not only women and men, it, it means all genders. We try to reach out to as many workers as possible um, to understand the diversity of experiences. Um, in terms of the, uh, my uh, presentation, whether I meant that the, the female on the initiatives were not necessarily good, um, I think what I tried to sort of imply is that sometimes the safety concerns are put there as a sort of an improvement, and they are. But the implications of that for women workers are not always fully calculated. And that's the, that's this, that's the thing we're seeing with the women on the rise with Uber, that women drivers are actually getting a lot less. And that affects their overall sort of um, earnings on the platform. So on, an, on its own, it sounds like a great initiative, but we just need to evaluate the, the bigger picture as to are they still able to compete on the same level as male drivers if they sign up to this initiative. And a lot of the time when platforms come up with this women only diversity inclusion kind of uh, policies, they sort of miss out on the bigger picture as to why women are on these platforms to begin with, and that is to make money. Um, and I think that this was the sort of the, the thing that I wanted to capture. I think, of course, women's, um, same with Swiggy, same with Indian platform that locks uh, women workers out at 6 p.m. Yes, because India is, at least some parts of in India, women can be at danger if they're out alone after 6 p.m. But this has an effect, and this effect um, is not being compensated uh, by the platform. They're not earning more in the other hours, for instance, that they're able to work. They still are working; they're competing on the same level as male workers. So this is um, this is what I wanted to sort of imply there. Um, so. Red buttons, yes, they can be very useful, especially in case of emergency. Um, but what we're hearing from women workers is that they don't always work because for the red buttons or the sort of the panic buttons to work, someone needs to be on the other end of that button. But if that, uh, if that worker is clogging out at 5 p.m., but the woman worker is working at 10 p.m., that doesn't really work. So again, this bigger picture really needs to be part of how we discuss these sort of um, women's safety measures that the platforms are proposing. Um, in terms of the um, engaging with platform work doesn't also mean women don't get more opportunities. Yes, this is also not what I try to imply. This is what I mentioned with um, sort of, you know, different women having different experiences on platform work, depending on what they were doing off platforms as well. Like interior designers working on online platforms can get um, a lot more opportunities, you know, instead of being limited to a national um, territory, they can work across the world and can, um, you know, that can unlock opportunities. Women, in terms of flexibility, working on online platforms can reach global clients. But this is not always the case, whereas we hear about flexibility, the work opportunities, these are always the first things that are mentioned. But the experiences we see from workers are that um, the working conditions are not always um, at the same level as how these opportunities are being marketed. Okay, finally. <laughs> um, Global chains and au pairs, that au pairs, that is completely um, true. I completely agree as a person who has been studying global care chains for the past decade. Um, and the kind of issues, the working conditions um, that we sort of talk about in platformized care work, um, they, we are seeing that the structural issues in care work are being platformized. They are being carried over to the digital platformized version of care. Um, and this is why we need to sort of, you know, not only focus our attention to the platforms perhaps, but how um, care works being undervalued, invisibilized um, as a general sector um, is still important for us to debate. 
I just want to, I assume we're about to finish, but I just want to um, give a big round of applause to a couple of invisible workers at the back doing the translation who are absolutely amazing. <laughs> absolutely blown me away with how brilliant you are. Anyway, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Muchas gracias.